Zoom. Um, I don't think Doug needs any introduction, but just to quickly say this evening, we're going to take more histories from Seminary Avenue. Um, Doug, the whiz techno, the writer, the now re relentless historian, is going to tell us about seminary, but he's also going to invite us to and encourage us to look into our own history, show us ways that we might actually become involved in the history of Hopo. Um, we're on a really tight turnaround, unfortunately, so just one housekeeping point, if we could leave questions to the end, that would be really great. So thank you again for coming, and Doug, when you're ready. Okay, this meeting is being recorded on Zoom. So welcome everybody here and welcome to the Zoomers as well. Uh, hopefully we'll have some time for questions at the end and if you're on Zoom, uh, please type the questions and they'll be relayed up to the stage. So the topic tonight is how we figure out about local history. How can we dive in and understand about local history? And the test subject is Seminary Avenue, because if you know Seminary and Hopewell, it's rather undistinguished. There's nothing about that street or those buildings that look historic. And it turns out there's something there after all. So that's what we're gonna look at tonight. Um, the vehicle I'm using to look at Seminary Avenue is the Hopewell Valley History Project. Yeah, that was good. Um, so the History Project, if you don't know about it, is a totally volunteer effort to grab as much local history as we can, historic materials, get them digitized, get them online, and freely share them. And so the site has been there for about three years now, and with the help of more than 90 contributors, some of whom are in this room, uh, we have documents, maps, images, videos, and briefs that we've written describing the history of the area. So that's a good place to start because the whole point of the site is to help you get starting in the history. So I'm gonna be zooming through some sample buildings on Seminary Avenue and show how we know what we know about them and how different kinds of searching produces more useful results depending on how the building was used. So I'll be doing a bunch of examples. For more information, go online to the History Project site. It's at the bottom of every page of the presentation and uh, there'll be expanded slides there and then um, write-ups about the street and the history of the buildings along the street as well. The subtext of the presentation is please help us preserve our history before it's gone. So if you have stuff, if you know of materials, please contact us. The email address is on every page of the website and we will scan stuff and share the digital files with you. And if you're done with the files, if you're done with the materials and you wanna get rid of them, we can be a conduit to the sponsors actually of this talk the Hopewell Public Library, the Hopewell Museum, and the Hopewell Valley Historical Society, um, who have each received materials that have come in through the history project here. And uh, we're also interested in oral history as well, as you'll, you'll hear some examples of that. So let's begin. So how do you begin? How do you start thinking about the history of a street or a town or a building or a property or whatever? And the answer is, Next slide, please. The maps. So this is an example of a fire map of Hopewell from 1912 done by the Sanborn Map Company. And uh, these map companies came to your town and surveyed and mapped out every structure in your town so that fire companies, insurance companies could write insurance on the structures. So there's tremendously useful to us. And what you see here in 1912 is Seminary is pretty much filled out by this time. And I've highlighted the buildings that I'm gonna be talking about tonight. So left to right down the middle, which is Seminary Avenue. Number six is a, labeled as a barbershop. And 
what's interesting about that is that building not only no longer exists, but you can't even see that there's a property there. All there is now is a driveway going back. So we'll talk about that building. Next to it is 810, which you can see is divided. It's a duplex, stores on both sides. And then further down, number 16 is a bakery. And there is no building on the street, but there's a setback building, which is a bakery. So we'll talk about the history of that. And then along the bottom and the, on the left ac across the street, number 19 is a residence, which is also currently a barber. Number 17 is a grocery store. Number 15 is labeled 2B Fire Station. This was actually the first home of the Hopewell Fire Department, though you couldn't tell it by looking at it today. And number 1113 is the livery for the hotel to in the bottom left corner, which we now call the Hopewell Inn. So that's where they parked the horses for people who came to the inn, okay? So let's look at those buildings and talk about how we know what we know about those buildings. Next slide. So this is number six, Seminary Avenue. That's that barber shop. If you look along the bottom, we're starting with the maps. So the history project has all these maps available. In the bottom left is the 1902 map, and there's a gap there. There's an empty space where that building eventually would be. The 1912 map, which we saw earlier, shows that there's a barber shop there. And then the 1927 map in the bottom right shows the barber shop has been expanded and is meeting up with the building next door, which has been expanded. So at, all of the, at this point, all we have is some dates and a barbershop, but we don't know anything about it. So the next step would be to go to the history project and look at photos. Because on the history project, we have thousands of photos and they're organized by town and street address in the town as we figure out what the heck the photo is showing. And you will find this photo in the top right here. This is Harry Cox's shaving parlor. This shack, this barber shack, is the building that shows in the map with an addition behind it. So now we have a name and we have a date and we have a business, so that's good to know. And also on the history project are a whole bunch of documents that we've digitized and brought online and transcribed. And in those, uh, there is actually several documents, promotional documents about Hopewell and what a great town it is and all the great businesses here and all the rest of that. And one of them, the 1914 Hopewell Herald Progress Edition mentions Harry Cox. So there's a write-up about him there, a brief summary about this great young man who started a barbershop here. So now we have a name, a business and some dates. So how do we find out more? So next slide. Uh, the next easy place to go is to try to find some family records, to try to get the vital statistics, try to get the names of family members so that we can see, search deeper. So I definitely remember, uh, recommend doing a web search. It can't hurt, you never know what you're gonna find. You may find various newspaper articles or obituaries or whatever, it's definitely worth doing. And then another great site is findagrave, findagrave.com. And it has, uh, it's another volunteer site. If you don't know about it, people go out, take pictures of gravestones and then create a page for that person, uh, for that gravestone. So here's the page for Harry Lester Cox. It has a picture of the gravestone. It tells us his birth date, his death date, where he's buried. And at the bottom, um, other volunteers have come in and added links to family members, and links to um, children as well on the site. Now you notice, Find a Grave has more information than the gravestone tells you. It says Harry Lester Cox. So you're relying on some volunteer to have put down the correct information, but it's a good starting point, but take it with a grain of salt, right? And then there's two mega sites for searching family records in general. One of them is familysearch.org, which is a free site put up by the Church of the Latter-day Saints. And another is Ancestry, which costs money. Um, but Ancestry is available in the library edition in the public libraries. So if you go to the Mercer County Library, for example, and you're physically in the building, you can log into Ancestry and search there. 
So that's a great way to get started as well. And these have census records and birth records and mil military records and links to find a grave and links to newspapers, all kinds of stuff as the result of a search. And at the bottom, you see several examples of the things you can find. So on the bottom left is Harry Cox's draft registration card for World War I filled out by Harry Cox. So if you're confused about how to spell his middle name or exactly what his birth date was, here it is in his handwriting, okay? So unless he's lying to us, he, this is pretty solid evidence for where he lives and where he works and all that kind of thing. You'll also find other kind of stuff. So in the middle bottom are, is a yearbook. So you'll find college yearbooks and even high school yearbooks that people have scanned and shared. And then in the bottom right, amazingly enough, is the admissions book for the Hebrew Sheltering Guardian Society. And, we, and somebody not only scanned all this, but they typed in the names for us. So if you do a search, you will find the entry for Mormor Zwaf at age 10, when he was sent off basically to an orphan's home because his mother had died. So all of this kind of stuff is available. And once you've done this sort of first level of searching, you have a pretty good handle on names and dates and birth dates and locations and things like that. And then you can search further. So next slide. The next place to search is census records. So um, in the Hopewell area, we have pretty good census records, federal census records through the 1800s up through 1950, which was just released. Um, unfortunately, they don't have full street addresses till 1920, which would have been helpful. Oh, well. And there's also the state census, which comes out uh, in years that end in five. So these are tremendously helpful. They tell you the family members and the other people living in the house. Um, they're not always correct. They miss people sometimes, families, entire families disappear from census records and they're handwritten. So sometimes they're hard to understand, but they're available. So the federal site is archives.gov and both Family Search and Ancestry will search census records because they've been transcribed and you can search on the names and things like that. And they'll even help you understand the handwriting on the census records, which you can see is a little problematical sometimes. So next slide, let's see what Harry Cox, how Harry Cox appears in census records. So in the top, we have the 1900 US census of Hopewell Borough, and there's entries here for Harry Cox and his two parents. So Harry is age 15, his father, Reeder Cox, is age 75, and lists his occupation as farmer. They're living on a farm near Hopewell. Uh, the mother, Elizabeth Cox, has had, she reports, 11 children, of which five are still living. So speaking of labor, I mean, that's really impressive. And um, another little note here, this census record for Harry has his age wrong and his birth date wrong. It's off by 10 years. The census record says that Harry is 25 years old in 1900. And that's just not true. So this is an example of problems you can find. If I found this record first and I looked at it and I say, oh, that's not my Harry Cox. It must be some other Harry Cox, but it's just wrong. It's just absolutely wrong. And if I did a search for Harry Cox by birth date, it would not find this record. The search would fail to find this record. So in that kind of case, you find family members in other censuses and then you search, in this case, I'd search for Reader Cox because that's a relatively uncommon name. And then I could find this. Okay, so in the, the 1905 New Jersey census below, there's less information, but they're, they're all still in the same house. They're working, but Harry Cox has a trade. He's a barber. And so this matches up to the dates that we saw in the maps. So next slide. The next two census records show Harry Cox becoming a family man. He's gotten married. He has his first child in 1910. They're living in a rented home on Columbia Avenue. And he's not only a barber, but the census asks, 
are you working for somebody else or are you self-employed? And so he reports, it's his own shop. And that's the picture that we saw earlier. And then the 1915 Jersey census shows there's one more child in the family and Harry now owns a house. And the census asks and Harry reports he's mortgaged to own that house, but he does own a house. This is a young man moving forward in his life, right? So next slide. The other source for lots of information are the newspapers. So the good news is newspapers give you facts because they're typically true. And they also give you slice of life, what's happening in the town and the people's lives and that kind of thing. And so I just have a couple sample clips here to show you the kinds of things you can figure out. So there's local news, burglars broke into Mrs. Gould's house and stole 50 cents. It's actually Mrs. Gould's store. And you, this wouldn't mean anything to you until you learned that Mrs. Gould was one of the early owners of the building that we now call Chubby's Restaurant. So now, now there's the connection. The next one is business news. Robert McIntosh was sick, but he's back to his upholstery business. And it gives us an address. He's located at a new address. So now we know he's in town, he's moved to a new address. It doesn't tell us the old address, which would have been nice, um, but this is the kind of way we piece together information about these people. And Macintosh ends up on Seminary Avenue. So this is part of his story. Then there's social news, birth, weddings, obituaries, that kind of stuff. And then just little clips like you see here. So um, a family in Glenmore moved to the Stryker house on Center Street. So that's thin gruel, but if you're trying to track that family in Hopewell, you now know they were in Hopewell on the state, which is not a census year. So you know something more as a result of that. And you learn family connections and friendships and that kind of thing through these reports. Then in the, the bottom picture, sometimes these articles have pictures in them and you just get lucky. So in this case, this is George Kronz, who you will meet later. And he was a local barber and he joined the Navy and here's, here he is decked out ready for the Navy. And we get a picture, so we're lucky. And then in the bottom right is a fascinating example. These are executor auctions of personal property and buildings. That's very common to sell all the personal property of people even if they have family, amazingly enough. So this is Jenny Cruiser who was on Seminary Avenue and you can see what kind of equipment she had, what kind of appliance she had. She had an electric sweeper, uh, the size of her rugs, the things she regarded as the antiques in the house, that kind of thing. Just fascinating. And you see the same thing for businesses when they go out of business. So where do you find out? Where do you find these newspapers and which newspapers should you be interested in? Well, the number one local paper in Hopewell, of course, is the Hopewell Herald. And the Hopewell Herald was printed through 1955 and it does cover more than just Hopewell Borough. It covers the Hopewell area nicely. And it's available on two sites, newspapers.com and newspaperarchive.com. Um, the first has much better, much more friendly searching. Uh, the second, unfortunately, has some things that the first site misses. So you, you really need to do both if you're doing deep, deep searching. And then the Trenton papers, and particularly the Trenton Evening Times, has quite a bit of local and regional news. And they tend to have business news because people are registering businesses in Trenton and they tend to have more pictures as well. So they're a really useful source. So the George Kronz picture, for example, is the Trenton Times. And that's available on, on genealogybank.com. And then the other two sites I mentioned earlier, Family Search and Ancestry, also have links into these newspaper sites and will return newspaper results. But newspapers cost money. And roughly, these are about $20 a month to subscribe to these sites. Uh, the price gets lower if you uh, subscribe for a period of time. You can also bundle, you can also add features. 
but they also offer free trials and sometimes they have you know memorial day weekend is free or you know, that kind of thing so you can definitely experiment with these sites and check them out other sites online um, princeton is bringing princeton papers online the town topics is online and sometimes has hopeful news so that's a good place and then the library of congress is aggregating papers from around the country as well so the good news is lots of papers. The bad news is they're on a whole bunch of different sites. They cost money. There are gaps in them. And the, as you can see, the text quality is not great and the papers are sometimes damaged. So you can search for things and you just don't find them. You just don't find them. So that's the newspaper story. So let's go to the next slide and see just a quick example of the kinds of things that we can figure out about Harry Cox. So there is a report online, a full brief about Harry Cox in this building online, but just to summarize the kinds of things we know, he starts out as a farmer laborer in age 15, six years later, he's married and he's built this barbershop that we have a picture of. Three years later, the paper runs a laudatory article about his third anniversary. He's added a barber chair, he's hired additional barbers, he's started building additions to his building. You know, he's, he's made a, a success of himself already. By 1920, he bought the entire corner property, which includes his building. And that's based on 10 cent haircuts and shaves. I mean, wow. And it, also he was working hard at other things. He was managing the theater down the street, which you'll meet later. By 23, he had partnered with Harry Cox, Harry Cray, and the business was then Cox and Cray, and they were making an even harder push into um, not only shaving men, but doing ladies' work as well. In 1932, there was a big hubbub with the Lindbergh kidnapping and press descending on Hopewell, and they all needed their shaves and haircuts. So the barbers were even more busy and then the 1940 census asks, how hard do you work? And Harry self reported he was working 60 hours a week. This was a busy, busy guy. But Harry Cox did die in 1945 at age 59. His partner, Cray, then partnered with George Kronz. Remember, we saw a picture of George Kronz in the Navy. And uh, they continued the business in this building into the 50s. But by the late 50s, they had moved next door to Eight Seminary, which is a beautiful segue to the next thing I'm gonna look at. And what exactly happened to this building? We don't have a report of it, but we have an oral history recollection from Raymond Cox, Harry's son, who was also a barber in Hopewell, that basically the building was shot, it had no foundation, and it just had to go. So, that's the Harry Cox story. And you can see how we weave together all these pictures, pieces to make sense out of them. So let's try that technique with another building. Next slide. This is 810 Seminary Avenue. This is the building right next door. It's, there are other similar buildings down the street. These are duplexes, left and right sides are separate. They're rented out as stores. And so these are very much newspaper research projects because you're looking in the paper, trying to find stores and people who are in, this, in these buildings based on ads and sometimes articles about the businesses. So across the bottom, some samples um, in, in the early 1900s, this was Stout's Tinning and Plumbing. Then there were some electric companies here who then moved down the street. Then another entrepreneur, and I've, another young entrepreneur, Helen Fisher, who had gone to beauty school, but also like Harry, wanted to have her own shop. So she came here to Seminary Avenue, set up her shop and was successful enough to eventually move down the street where she operated her shop till she retired. So another, another story like that, it's just fascinating. And then there were other businesses here, shoe stores, Pacman Jewelers and others. But the two pictures, however, show you that the current building is not the original building. The original building is the second photo here, the decrepit looking one taken in 2006. So this building was basically worn out by 2006 and was torn down and replaced 
by the building in the top right. And it, that building was deliberately designed to echo the original facade, but of course it has a second story behind it. So that's a, that's a duplex rental um, retail story for that kind of building. Then there are other buildings which have a sole owner who's often living there and also running a store there. And so for that, we need to do some other kind of research and that's the next slide. Thank you, which are deeds. So the good news is there are deeds online, but the bad news is there's a substantial gap in our Hopewell deeds, oh well. But the deeds do tell us who the buyer and the seller, sometimes they tell us prices, they describe the property. But then the most important thing is at the end of the deed, after it describes the property, it also says, this is the same property that was recorded in an earlier deed book where Jones sold this to Smith or whatever on this date and it's on this page in this previous deed book. So this way you can chain back through the deeds and follow the progression. And most of the time that information is there, which obviously is tremendously helpful. So the Mercer County Clerk's Office has digitized their deeds starting in around 1950 and they're available online. You can search by name and date and location and you can, you can pull up a scan of the original deed. So that's tremendously helpful. But then there's a gap till 1900 where we don't have deeds. So what you can do is chain back from current day to somewhere before 1950 and then you get one more leap into the gap with the reference to the previous deed, and then you're stuck till you get, you have to pick up the chain somewhere before 1900 again. Those earlier deeds are on familysearch.org. They came to Mercer County and digitized the entire friggin' deed books, just thousands and thousands of pages. It's just amazing. And you see them in the top right here. They aren't nicely typewritten like the Mercer deeds. Um, they're handwritten. And so you have to go through the somewhat laborious process of looking up a name in the index and then figuring out which deed you want to look up and then find the right deed book and then look to page 1650 and find that deed and you end up with this image in the top right. It's handwritten, but it's got the same information, the names and the link back to the previous deed. So it's tremendously helpful. So here's an example of a building where we use deeds. Now this is a somewhat nutty story and a multi-phase story. So let me step through it. So the maps in the bottom right in 1902, what you see is a small bakehouse in the middle of the property set back from the street. In the second map in 1912, you see that's been expanded into a two-story house and bakehouse connected to the back but it's still not up on the street. In the third map, 1927, there now is a building on the street and that building is shown in blue here. And that's the theater. And that matches the building that you see in the upper right, which is what you see when you walk down the street. You don't notice all this other stuff behind it. You just notice this front building. So the original story, the bake stop story is really a deed story and a uh, business news story. So you learn about Webster Van Dyke and the people who bought his business. Eventually Cornelius Allen bought that business and then sold it to somebody else and then moved down the street. But then in 1914, Cornelius Allen got the theater bug and decided he wanted to have a theater. So he was the one who built the building that we see from the street now. And that was the Hope Theater which operated from the mid 1910s into the 1920s as the movie theater of Hopewell. And here's an ad for the Hope Theater, admission 10 cents, come have a good laugh, right? And so that theater operated till uh, 1922. Uh, it was sold and resold. Harry Cox was running the business, but then there was a fire in 1922. The building was um, restored, renovated, but unfortunately, that was the end of the use of the building as a theater. So we've made it all the way to 1922, and there's all that stuff in the background. So we turn the page, next slide. And here's the rest of the story. 
which is back to being really a newspaper story. So we look in the newspaper, we find articles and ads, and we figure out who was in there. The electric shop moved from down the street, there was a meat market, et cetera. And then the deeds tell us from 1940s to the 1970s, this was owned by two families, the Lessers and the Smiths, who lived in the building and ran what they called family stores, basically department stores where they sold shoes and clothing and other kinds of goods. And um, I, I've talked to the families, the children of these people, and they, and they say, yeah, Hopewell did need a department store. There were lots of kids who used lots of sneakers and wore out their sneakers. There were farmers who needed their boots and people needed tough clothing, you know, for tough times. So, so that building, this building was successful as a department store basically for decades. So moving on, next slide. So we're now going across the street to 19 Seminary Avenue. And this basically is a deed story because it had so few owners and they were residential owners, but it's also an oral history story. So from 1919 to 1972, this was the home of the Holcombs. There were two generations of Holcombs who lived here, purely residential business, uh, home. And then in 1972, Bob Witowski bought the building and opened his Mr. Haircut business. And he's still there today. And Bob is a direct link back to Harry Cox, where we started the whole story. And so Bob joined the Navy, became a barber, joined the Kronz and Cray business. That's why I went into all I detail earlier. Worked with George Kronz, the Navy guy, and Bob was Navy too. And he tells the stories because he heard the stories sitting around the barber's tear, the good old days, what it was like cutting hair, what it was like when all the reporters came to town for Lindbergh, et cetera, et cetera. So we have that information because Bob's still around to tell us, which is just really cool. So moving down the street, we're going left to right down the other side of seminary now towards Broad Street. The next building is this building. So this is not a whole bunch of businesses in a building so much as it is a building that had a single use as a grocery store from 1922 to 1978. It just went through a bunch of different owners, some of whom owned the store and ran the business and some of whom owned the building and lived there as well. So this was Ashton's and Edling's and Shank's and Scabetto's and Vaccarino's and ended up finally with the airlocks. So it's been used for various other things since, but this was a major grocery store in Hopewell for a long, long time. And because it's a grocery store, we have ads. So that's the next slide. Wow, thank you, you're quick. Um, so you can see from the ads that you can tell what these people were selling, what products they were promoting the most. And in the top right, you can see the specific products and prices for goods. So these kinds of ads are trem tremendously helpful. And we still have Tide today and Charmin toilet tissue today, amazingly enough. And we have a couple pictures as well. So the, the top picture is courtesy of the Shank family. And you can see how the, they have the, the goods decorated in the windows just stacked up beautifully. And the bottom picture is Paul and Rita Ehrlich, the last grocery store owners here, really the last full service grocery store operating in Hopewell right here. And you can see it's a packed with goods, you know, all kinds of things that people might want. It was still useful in the seventies because there were uh, women at home with their kids who just couldn't get out to the grocery store. There were elderly people in town. There were other people who wanted special foods and special goods and Paul would order them for them and he would deliver, amazingly enough. And so um, I've talked to his family as well. His daughters talk about working in that store and the one young teenage daughter being left alone because dad was going out doing a delivery and a customer comes in and, and picks up some stuff to buy. Of course, there were not prices and codes stamped on the, the goods. So 
the daughter and the customer just sort of negotiated what sounded like a good price. And that was fine. That's how you did business back then. So th these are great, great stories. So the next slide, continuing up the street, this um, totally unfancy, unspecial, undecorated building is actually the home of major institutions in Hopewell in the early 1900s. So this was built in 1912 for the Hopewell Fire Department. It was used as Borough Hall and for other meetings. It was the first office of the Hopewell Building and Loan Association. And then in 1915, the Hopewell Free Public Library, the predecessor of the current library, moved in there and was on the second floor. So this is an institution story. And so we can cheat here because the, these institutions wrote histories and we have histories of these institutions and there's briefs on the website about them as well. And there's pictures as well, so that's helpful. So next slide. In the bottom right, we have a photo of this building, the front of this building from 1915 when the, when the Hopewell Public Library moved in. So they were on the second floor and that door in the bottom left of the picture uh, went up to the second floor and that's how you went to the library. And you can compare it to the current day building above and you can see the facade in the bottom right of the building has changed, but it's the same building. Then we have the picture on the left, which is courtesy of the Hopewell Fire Department. And this is the same building. So it's a little confusing to begin with, but the, the trick here is to understand you're looking at the side of the building. This is the side that faces Broad Street, the side that's on the same side as the livery. And so back then, fire engines were fire wagons, horse drawn. And so the horses could be in the livery and then the fire wagon could be parked in this building. That's why you don't need a big fancy building. You're not running big pumper trucks around, right? And so we have the story of this building, but by 1921, the fire department moved out. By 1925, the museum moved out and the building no longer has any evidence of its previous uses and it's been used as a residence in multiple stores ever since. Okay, so next slide. This is the last building we're gonna talk about on Seminary Avenue. This is the livery building. So if you look in the maps at the bottom, in the bottom left in 1902, this is shown as a setback building. So this is not the building, the current building that you see in the top right picture. This is a different building, which was set back from the street because it was full of horses and horses smelled, right? And this shows as A. Cray's livery because Andrew Cray owned the Central Hotel next door, what we call the Hopewell Inn. Then the middle map, 1912, we still see it as a livery. And then the bottom map, 1927, it shows as an auto repair shop. Now, if we go to the papers, we can find some clippings that talk about this building. So there's two of them here. So in 1917, the, uh, one of the local funeral directors, Mr. Forsyth, uh, moved into this building and had his vehicles and his furniture business. I don't quite understand that in that building because the livery business was phasing out. And then in 1927, the uh, other add here is George Clark reporting that he has moved his business, his car repair business into this building. So that maps, that matches the map in the bottom right corner. And we have a picture of Clark's garage. So that building actually says Clark's garage on it. And that is the livery building that used to be there that was set back and it matches the map which shows a two-story building with one-story additions on the two sides. And so with this ad, we know exactly when Clark moved in and that will help us date the picture as well. This picture we did not have a month ago. This is the kind of thing that turns up because people kindly find stuff. So thanks to them. So the open question now is what happened to that livery and what caused the new building to be built? So that's a good question. Next slide. Thank you. 
Um, and the answer is, if you go into the deeds, you can see it being bought in 1946. You can see it being bought in 1959 and being turned into the auto parts business that current residents remember. And then sometime in 1960, that livery disappeared and this current building appeared. So when did that happen? I can't find any newspaper articles about it. Maybe the fire department has a record. We haven't been able to check that, um, but we do have oral history. So I've talked to two families. One was a young family who was living next door and remembers a fire. And they remember the age of their children when the fire occurred. And so they can date when that fire was. So that's great. And then the other are actually children of one of the grocery store owners up the street. And they were actually a member of the Hopewell Fire Department. And they were standing there with a hose putting out that fire. So we're really, really sure the livery burned down, okay? We have pretty convincing stories about that livery building down. However, they each from their memory compute when that happened and they differ. Their dates are off by two or three years. So that's gonna be a little vague still. Hopefully we'll eventually figure that out. So when that burnt down, the current building that you see today was built and then has been since renovated as well. So that's the end of the some examples moving down the street, showing how you can explore different buildings. And then depending on how it's used, you can use different information to chase up the story and fill in the story. So I have one more example of it for you. Next slide, which is Plump's store. So the this is an example of what happens when you can't stop yourself doing this kind of research. You find this little thread and you pull on that thread and then things happen and then you can't stop yourself. It's getting late at night, but what the heck? And so uh, I confess, okay? So plump store. So here's an article that says, the church is having a rummage sale at plump store on Seminary Avenue. Great. So you search for plump at store and there's no other references. There's no plump as a store owner on seminary. What the heck is this talking about? Nor do we have an address. So where is this on Seminary Avenue? Well, to the right here, we have um, an article in the Trenton Times, which doesn't assume that you know where plump store is and tells you. So we get an address. This is plump store was at 10 Seminary Avenue which was that original duplex that we saw with side-by-side -side stores. And so where do we go next? Well, Plump is a rather uncommon name, particularly in Hopewell. So going and chasing the census is a good approach. So we find them. We find Henry and Christina Plump in the 1930 census, and they're living together with their niece and with Mrs. Plump's father. And the only odd thing about this is the occupation listed for both Mr. and Mrs. Plump is none. There's no occupation listed. So that's a little weird. So let's do some more digging. As we search the newspapers, we find different references. But we're going to assume at this point that the Plumps owned this building. And so it was Plump store because they were renting it out. So we can go to the census and we can go to the newspapers and try to chase that down. So, um, so we go to the deeds actually here and we can find a 1963 deed that says um, the Christina, the Mrs. Plump estate sold this building in 1963 and it has a back reference in it to when the building was bought and that's in 1930. It was purchased by Mrs. Plump in 1930. So they were the owners of the store at the time. So our theory works. They were just the owners. And while we're searching, we might stumble into some other evidence about this, which you see at the bottom here. So you can see they were renting out the store. So here's a couple ads, store for rent, number eight, number 10 seminary, which are the two sides of the building. You can see they were renting other stores and other houses in the area. So they were really in the real estate business. And the smoking gun 
is the article on the bottom right, which comes from the Trenton Times, which says they had formed a real estate company. So that's definitely what they were doing. Why they didn't want to admit it on a census, I don't know, but that's what we get. So while we're doing this searching, we're also running into other articles about plump and we get some slice of life stories about the plumps. So Mrs. Plump, next slide, fell from horse and was injured, injured her, her neck and injured her, her ankle, but she's fine now. And then Mr. Plump fe also fell, but from the barn on their property and he injured his leg and he injured his head, but he's fine now. And then even worse, you know, things keep happening to this family. Mrs. Plump was literally struck by lightning. Oh my gosh. And was, couldn't speak for a day, but she's fine now, okay? So this is the kind of thing you find. You follow that thread, you can't stop yourself. It's getting late at night, but it's such a great story. And you keep going, but we're not done. Believe it or not, we're not done because uh, the Plump family was struck by metaphorical lightning as well. Now, if you remember back to the original census record, the Plumps were living outside of Hopewell, out East Broad, across from Aunt Molly Road, where there's a turn, and their old elderly father was living with them, and his name was Amandus Hockmuth. And he was the surprise witness at the Lindbergh kidnapping trial. Next slide, please. And there we are. So they, that whole family was all over the news. He gave the testimony that put the defendant, Bruno Hoffman, at that corner in a car, definitively recognized with a ladder in his car. And that, that was the story. So there was innumerable articles about them and whether you can believe him and whether he's too old and whether his eyesight is bad and all that kind of thing. And then the articles continued. So in 1938, the, the major people who testified in the, excuse me, in that trial received awards. Hockmuth received a thousand dollar award for his testimony. So it was all over again and all over in the news and reporters were interviewing the plumps and interviewing Hockmuth as well. So the whole thing was just crazy. But this is what can happen when you follow a little thread. All I had was this tiny little, tiny little piece of information about Plump's store, and it turned into this crazy story. So this is what happens, and this is why it's so fun to do this kind of stuff. So to conclude, and then we'll have time for questions and Zoom people if they've been typing in questions. So we can uh, we can pass up questions from the Zoom as well. So to research local history online, you can start with just an evening with free resources and chase stuff down and get, if you're lucky, a whole bunch of information, at least a starting point of information. So on the History Project site, there's the maps, there's a whole bunch of documents that have write-ups about people and places in town. There's all these photos and imagery and videos as well. Um, there's, um, and then you can search family and property records. So family records on various sites, census records and deeds as well. So depending on what kind of building you're looking at, you can chase those different paths as well. And then as you build up more information, you can do better searching because you know the names of the family members and you know the name of the street and you know the street address, that kind of thing. Newspapers, as you can see, are tremendously useful and expensive, unfortunately. So you can get them bundled with Ancestry or Family Search, or you can get one and get a start with them. And then there's the big sites, Ancestry and Family Search, which lets you do a whole deep search and find all different kinds of records associated with a particular person born at a particular time in a particular place. And there'll be loose ends and there'll be you know, false information and there'll be matches to the wrong thing, 
but as you build up the evidence that will grow. And these sites also have family trees. So uh, people who are interested in ancestry will build family trees of their family ancestries and post them. So you can then follow somebody else's research and see the sources that they used to establish the important dates and then start making sense of things that way as well. So that's the story. Uh, please help. If you have materials, if you know of people who have materials, we're desperately interested in preserving that stuff. So we'll come, we'll scan them, we'll share the digital files with you. And if you're done with them, we will then pass them on, help pass them on to the appropriate place. So that's it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So are there questions? And questions on Zoom? I can't, oh, yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, Sanborn did most of the maps in our area and they're all on the History Project site. That's one of the things that we worked really hard to get. So you can, you can go to the map area and search for the, the Sanborn fire maps. And there's also a page on the site where you can go um, for your particular town, so Pennington or Mount Rose or whatever, and it'll show you the information associated with them. How many years back, back when they did they start? Yeah, so the, the fire map started in the late 1800s and continued into the first 25 plus years of the 1900s. And they're just tremendously useful. They show every structure in town. It's, it's mostly, it's the, the, the municipalities. So the early Hopewell one just has a small area and then it expands slightly, but no, it's not the farming area. There are other maps that I didn't show here, obviously that show that kind of thing. And there's very early maps that show where the early farmsteads were in the area and that kind of thing as well. Are there other questions here or online? So I have uh, one person online that, uh, Gary Sorecki. Um, oh, Gary, yeah. Gary uh, just didn't ask the question, but just wanted to say that the New Jersey State Library has a list on its website yeah. Yeah. So the New Jersey State Library has a really nice long list of New Jersey newspapers and where to go find them, which is a huge long list, unfortunately, including Chronicling America, which is the uh, Library of Congress site I mentioned earlier. Unfortunately, that doesn't have. Um, hyperlocal Hopewell papers, but if you're doing a broader search, that's helpful. Yeah. And question. Uh, I noticed on the ads that there were telephone numbers. Yes. Was there a reverse directory in those days that you actually knew where the telephone was? Yes, so telephone numbers. So telephone numbers were originally um, call 123A and things like that. And then it became Hopewell 123 or and then eventually it became 466, and then it became 609, 466. So you see the phone numbers evolving over time. We don't have reverse directories. We have some early directories, which are just two page lists. So they're easy to search and we've transcribed them to make them easier to search. Um, and then we were very lucky because of the whole Lindbergh thing. The state police collected a list of all the phone numbers in the general area. And they did a reverse directory. And we have that document on the site as well. So for example, the, um, the, the car repair place in the livery, for example, shows up there. And that's why I know his full name because the state police put that in their listing. So we have some, some of that kind of thing. And then the ads are inconsistent about listing phone numbers as well. Yeah, thank you. Also, we have another question. Um, uh, Rasami Araki asked, 
uh, are you going to do this again, but focus on another street and borough? Mm -hmm. So this is this is great. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, am I going to do this again and focus on other streets in the borough? Uh, eventually, yes. Um, I've been working around the borough, focusing on different things as they've been interesting. So last year, spent a lot of time down Railroad Avenue and the businesses on Railroad Avenue, the chocolate factory, the tomato factory. So there are extensive write-ups about them and there's talks about them online already. And um, also the Hopewell train stations, for example. And then for this general area of research, there's write-ups about the fire company and the library and those buildings associated with them. And then the buildings on the corner of Seminary Avenue, which is sort of over there, I guess, uh, and the Hopewell Inn, for example. So yes, we're, we'll be continuing to do this. And if you find me some really cool, useful material, I'll be more likely to work in that area. So. Uh, there's a pitch for you. Anything else, Bob? Yeah, um, Kathy Anders said, thank you for doing this. I'd love to find more information about Ms. Bob's email seminary. Yes. Yes, do I have a second? I have a second. I happen to have some extra slides. So, um, more information about Miss Bob's female seminary. So if you can step together forward about four slides, you'll see the face of Miss Box. There she is. So not the building on the corner of seminary and broad, but the next building up, uh, back up one. It's page 28. Yeah, tw uh, slide 28. Thank you very much. Yeah, there she is, Miss Bob's. The building next to it is the Hopewell Female Seminary. And this is how Seminary Avenue got its name. And so this was run as a school for young ladies from know, 1866 to around 1890. And it was run by this woman, Miss Elizabeth Boggs, who was a real character. And we have some stories about her and her experience uh, teaching and in Washington, D.C. as a principal and in D.C. during the Civil War. But um, I personally haven't been able to nail all that down. If somebody wants to dig into that, that would be wonderful, because there's clearly a great story here. And the museum has a lot of material on her and the school and the newspaper that the students put out and that kind of thing. So this building that you see in the bottom right corner is still there, as you can see in the top. The part to the right with the mansard roof is the original building that Miss Boggs built. And then the part to the left of it, she added later. And it's uh, since she closed the school, it's been mainly residential, but that building is still there and still going strong and a wonderfully interesting part of Hopewell. And when she said, when she called it a seminary, she just meant school. There wasn't a religious connection there. So yes, thanks for asking about Ms. Fox, because I did want to say that. And we're nearly out of time. One more question. Yeah, Jeff Ryan asks, you have said, you've done an amazing amount of detective work to piece all this information into a story. What got you interested in doing all of this? Oh, how did I get interested? Uh, it's all the fault of the Hopewell Library. What can I say? And some people sitting back there. Um, we, we started this all when the library did its um, house tour, garden tour, and we started digging into some things. And then we started figuring out it, that you needed these maps to understand. So we started collecting the maps. And then we said, hey, let's put them on the web. And then the thing has snowballed since there. And with the help of all these people, including people who sit down with me and go through photos and try to understand what the heck the photos show and that kind of thing, we've been able to put together this site. And then it's, it's really, really useful for doing research. So when things happen, like the work on the Hopewell Inn here or other buildings in town, that inspires us to dig into those some more. So the site is full of um, articles, but it's also full of blog posts that talk about different interesting things that we've stumbled into, different uh, photos that we found that we didn't know existed. We've even found entire books that nobody knew existed, and we've been able to scan them and get them online as well. So yes, um, thanks, Jeff.
And should we call it quits now? Yes. So thank you all very much. Thank you.